Seattle has a remarkable history for innovation, which has been captured and archived here at the Museum of History and Industry. Yet the question remains, how do we prepare the next generation of innovators? Amazon.com's Jeff Bezos hopes to do exactly that through his new Center for Innovation. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks. I think a lot of times when we think of innovation, we think of the individual genius sitting alone, you know, maybe in their garage, maybe in their attic, but sort of by themselves coming up with a great idea. And it does begin with a great idea. But you need to connect those ideas with the community around you. And we talk a lot about connecting, finding patterns. So that's really the next thing is to figure out what needs to be done and then who do you need to connect with to make that happen? Leonard Garfield is the director of the Museum of History and Industry, MOHAI. He oversaw the creation of the Bezos Center for Innovation. In this episode, we'll explore what places like Mohai can do to inspire the next generation of innovators. And does Seattle have a special creative DNA? The next step is really working together with the team. Uh, risk is involved. You can't do it if you don't try something that hasn't been done before and be prepared for failure. So how do you actually capture the process of innovation in a museum? Why would you have this kind of exhibit here? It's pretty amazing. So we've, we've ruled out coffee, and I think we've ruled out rain, uh, but there is something here. And, and what is that? And a lot of our innovators have said that there is a willingness to collaborate here. There's a willingness to take chances here. There's a kind of social structure that doesn't value hierarchy. It values good ideas coming into the mix and allowing the best ideas to rise to the top, regardless of where they're coming from. And then really it's trying to take those ideas to a scale that really allows the innovation to move the needle. Uh, move the needle in terms of an individual customer, but ultimately move the needle in the way we live, the way we work, really the way the world is today. And that's what we've seen in Seattle. Our great innovators from Bill Boeing to Bill Gates and beyond have really began with a good idea, they've scaled it up, and ultimately they've changed the world. We'll have more about Seattle's inventive streak when we return to Four Peaks and the Bezos Center for Innovation. Innovation happens when you bring people together in one place and see what happens. When people with different perspectives come together, intersect and collide. And when people have the resources and the institutions that allow them to think, produce new ideas and take those ideas and actually make them into world changing innovations. Margaret O'Mara is a history professor at the University of Washington. Her expertise is in how innovation drives growth and change which made her an ideal advisor to the Bezos Center for Innovation. Thanks to Margaret, we were brought in to produce the video content for the center, even as we interviewed many of the featured innovators for Four Peaks. I think there's three big things that we see in innovative cities that we see here in Seattle right here and now. One is that there are resources, there are the, the, the things that, that people in cities need, the, whether it's money, whether it's natural resources, whether it's um, a good location, that kind of position it well at that moment in history. The second thing is institutions, and institutions can be everything from a symphony to a university to a cancer research center. It's these places that allow that, um, people to come together and, and think and to collaborate and to create. We spoke to some of the top innovators in our region about their journey to success. And yes, there is a special sauce. Big ideas, collaboration, and even failure. Mark Roth's research in suspended animation might require you to suspend disbelief. Certainly his work is the stuff of science fiction, inducing hibernation in trauma patients so that doctors can perform miracles. No wonder that even as the MacArthur Foundation calls him a genius, he's also listed in Ripley's Believe It or Not. And that's also why Mark Roth of the Fred Hutchinson Research Center joins our exclusive list of the innovators. Mark, you're featured here at the new Bezos Center for Innovation. You just saw Jeff Bezos speak about the opening. Uh, what yeah. do you think of what you've seen so far? Well, I was really impressed. I had not been here before, and the thing that most impressed me was 
the way there's a focus in all of the exhibits around children and in ways for people in the next generation to be inspired to innovate, to, uh, to do what this part of the country is so good at and to continue that tradition. I mean, the first time that you actually applied this theory and saw it work or happen, mm -hmm. what, 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 what ran through your mind? Well, that uh, first that, that it wasn't true. <laughs> Actually, I uh, felt that it wasn't uh, that something we had done had led us to some artifact. So, so, you, so you you were, didn't believe it? No, no, no. In fact, uh, I should be clearer. There's a certain video that I have that I that we caught actually on tape. But it's it's um, it's an animal that we're videotaping with a webcam, and the animal becomes deanimated. And literally, it's like near five o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm totally depressed. I think we've killed the animal. I'm sure we've killed the animal. And then, because uh, all the vital signs have gone, and we're watching it. And I said, well, we've got to go. That's it. We've killed it. And so then, we're literally taking everything apart and going home, and, and somebody says, hey, the thing's starting to move. And I was like, come on, you switched the animal, and you're just playing with me or whatever. And, uh, and so it was quite a moment of disbelief, actually. You didn't know you had succeeded? No. In fact, I had thought that I had failed. Pretty much confident that I failed. Oh, that's amazing. And right away, we went right across the street and had a beer. So Trish, you've been doing this work for a long time, basically not only providing a sense of place with Taft, but also training the next generation of innovators. So what does this bring to your work, if anything? Well, I think it, it's an exciting place for kids to come and see, see what was and what can be and um, to be able to see more people who look like them as innovators. So I'm really excited about that. Trish Malines as Eco has always been a pioneer. She studied computer science in the late 70s, well before that degree came into fashion. She joined Microsoft before that tech giant went supernova in the mid-90s. Now she's leading the charge for teaching science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM, education in the Pacific Northwest. She even started her own school with remarkable results. As the founder of the Technology Access Foundation, Trish Malines as Eco is ahead of her time. That's why she joins our exclusive list of the innovators. Trish Malanza Zico from Taft, Technology Access Fund, uh, Welcome Foundation. Thank um, you. So you, it strikes me that you've always been ahead of your time, that you know, from the time that you decided to go to computer science, you joined Microsoft, as I said mm -hmm. in the introduction. Now there's all this conversation around STEM education, mm -hmm. but you were there years before. How does it feel yeah. to finally be redeemed? Oh, <laughs> it's pretty amazing, actually, when you think about um, how important STEM education is and the fact that students of color are now ahead. Um, we just need to get more of them there at when, this point. When you say students of color are now ahead, ahead of, of whom? The, the whole STEM movement, you know, so we focus on students of color and low-income students in STEM and for once they're actually getting ahead of the boom. When we first started in 96, the kids were behind and that's why we started and we focused mostly on technology and the idea was to get them to be inventors and creators of technology and we were able to accomplish that and move very quickly into the full STEM uh, spectrum and now what you're seeing is at least the Taft students are ahead of the game and we'd like to see more Taft students ahead of the game. You not only have to recognize how innovation happens, you have to recognize what you have to do to keep it. And part of what um, this exhi exhibit really focuses on is how to inspire the next generation of innovators. What do kids and young people need to understand the power of, to the innovator within them? And then what sort of place do they need to be in to get, that gives them tools, that gives them the place to take their idea and take it to the next level? So what we talk about here is what you need to spark the next wave and what we need to do here in Seattle to really main, not only maintain what we got, but think about how we do something new and even more exciting going forward. I think the way you guarantee it stays going is you keep the innovators that have gotten things started busy and excited so that they can train the next generation of innovators. And I think we see that happening in the South Lake Union. Amazon is across the street from the Institute for Systems Biology just down the way from the Fred Hutch. And here you're mixing people of very different types of innovation with the chance of bringing together integrated approaches to really difficult problems. We'll be right back with more Four Peaks from the Bezos Center for Innovation.
Welcome back to Four Peaks. We're at the grand opening of the Bezos Center for Innovation at the Museum of History and Industry. And this is some of the work that we did, featuring some of the region's best innovators. Here's the Going Big exhibit. We have some of the innovators talking what it takes to scale their ideas up. And we actually have one of those featured innovators here right now, Shwetik Patel from the University of Washington, an inventor. Thank you. And Shwetik, what do you think about seeing your name I, and lights here? It's a, it's a little embarrassing, but still, it, it's pretty fun. Yeah, scaling the technology is actually pretty challenging as an academic. You're you know, you, you're, you're in a mode where you're writing papers, you're educating students, but it's hard to get that technology out into the real world. But we're personally motivated to do that. We operate in the fact that, look, we're not going to have an impact until somebody else gets to use it. I've always had this philosophy. I haven't really had an impact until a million people touch the thing that I've built. So what does that mean? A million people have touched your thing. It could be a website that a million people have touched. It could be a piece of hardware, a piece of software. But if you have that idea that that's the scale I want to... Uh, I want to move forward to, that's what we're doing. So you utterly, absolutely believe that, and you've seen now the opening of the center, and you're going to see all these kids here watching you do say that. Yeah. Uh, is it easier to said than done? It's not easy. It's not easy, but I think it's something to aspire to, right? I mean, uh, uh, there, there's many ways to touch a million objects. You can build a website. You can just build a piece of hardware, like I said. But I think this is hopefully they'll get some inspiration out of it. And, and I've been lucky to be able to do that. And I hope to share some of these experiences with some of the students that are going to be coming through. How do you feel about this all now that you see it first? Yeah, it, well, it's a little overwhelming. It's like, wow, I never thought I'd end up in a museum. <laughs> it kind of makes me feel old, actually, if I'm in a museum at this point. Point. But no, I think it's going to be really fun. Um, I think I think it gives people ideas on what they could do. They can look, learn from some experiences that we've had, and and I, I, I just I'm glad that I can be an inspiration to others. Now let's listen to some of the other innovators we met as they inspire us with the secrets of their success. And when you look at this region, we got Costco, Nordstrom, Starbucks, Amazon, very customer centric companies that also seem to have a very strong core set of values. Is there something about this region that feeds that, or you know, was Costco and Nordstrom the first to sort of set that tone and the rest have followed? I think that a lot of it deals with uh, the, the families and the founders of these companies. If you look at uh, Starbucks, one of the principal reason, and I was uh, on the board of Starbucks for many, many years in, in the early days, and I worked with Howard to build the management team and build the employee um, benefit packages and things like that. So why did Starbucks end up to be so uh, compassionate to its employees? Howard Schultz uh, had lived through a, a series of things with his family in the East, and it reflected he, you know, not in my backyard. He wasn't going to let that happen. And also he knew me, and he saw the, the, the value system that we had infused into Costco. I had seen what the Nordstrom's had done relative to customer service. I knew all of that stuff. Um, and we all kind of fed off of each other. And, and that, that goes back also, I think, to the Boeing situation back in the uh, 60s. We're back with Howard Schultz from Starbucks. Howard, we recently sat down with Jeff Brotman, who's a, who founded Costco. And he was talking about the values that Costco has in terms of how it treats its people. Nordstrom has the same thing. And Jeff had actually mentioned he had sat down with you at some point in terms of reconciling and sharing some of the approaches you have in terms of how you treat your people. Costco's a great company. Is, is there something, and, and, and you guys have a great relationship, yeah. is there something about the water in Seattle that fosters this kind of approach? No, I've been asked that many, many times, both here at home and outside the country. What is it about Seattle? Uh, you know, I, I don't have a specific answer. Philosophically, I'd say it's a great place to live, so it attracts fantastic entrepreneurs who want to raise a family here. I think Nordstrom, in many ways, kind of uh, built the foundation of human service and treating people and their, and their customers in a way that others have followed. And the fact that Nordstrom, Costco, and Starbucks were three physical bricks and mortar retail companies that are founded here that have a th common thread of not only humanity, but trying to do the right thing for the customer and not only, not always serving the bottom line, uh, I think is uh, part of what we've all been able to do that has created this reputation. I'm not sure if it's the water, <laughs> it's certainly not the rain, uh, but I think it's, it's uh, you know, you are the company you keep and it's a great, uh, to be part of those two other companies to be mentioned in the same sentence is an honor for all of us at Starbucks. Howard Schultz says he sells 
doesn't sell coffee. He sells experience and relationship. So what do you, what do you think you're really in business doing? What is your business? Well, we are in business um, because when people see a glassy baby and it's lit, there, um, you can't help, even my pets, everyone is, everyone except for I guess they don't see color, but every, every human being responds to color and light, every one of them, all of us. And they either make us feel upbeat or they make us feel in love or they make us feel calm or some, some uh, emotion. And I think that that's what we really do at Gossip Baby. We build on people's life experiences so that they remember them, they cherish them, um, and that they, they feel, if they're afraid of them, they can work through that fear with that light of that candle. So if I take you back to that fateful day in 1995 where you hit that double that got Seattle into the uh, American League final, and we have it up on the screen right now, I'm looking at you right now at bat. Do you even, do you, how much do you remember of what was going on in your head in terms of the discipline that goes into that double? So there you are hitting it. I mean, it's a very quick thing that happens when you're running around the bases. What was going through your head at that point? Well, the, the uh, most, of, most of the thinking went before I went to the plate. Uh, in the previous at bat, I, I had the opportunity to tie the game and I struck out. So that, that was a failure. I went to the dog. You must have felt bad. How did you sort of say, I'm yeah. done, I, I'm just terrible, I'm never playing baseball again. Yeah, and that's what is so important that always, uh, if we're thinking in a negative way, just change to, a, you, we're able to change into a positive thinking. Uh, and uh, I went to the dog out and one of my teammates said, be ready next time you are going to deliver the hit. Those words switch my a state of thinking about the negative into seeing myself actually doing well. Hmm. So I start this routine that I had, mental exercises, only concentrating and visualizing myself making solid contact. Jesse, Dreambox learning is across the water in Bellevue. We're here in South Lake Union. You're not from Seattle originally. What does this say about the kind of people and companies that are setting up here to push innovation? I think we're in an area that really values micro-innovation. People don't think about innovation necessarily in only big things that they can do. We do a lot of micro-innovation in small areas, and I think what we can do is to try to shine on light on what's working in a small way, and then try to figure out how to scale it. Because in this area, it's in people's DNA, they're not fearful of innovation. They're not fearful of experimentation. They figure that not everything's going to work out, but when it does work out, that's when we have to shine a light on it, and that's when we have to scale it. And that's interesting because scale and size matter. You mentioned the two pizza, two pizza meetings, um, but the danger is if somebody as successful as you, if Amazon being successful, you have a lumbering, potentially a lumbering giant. How do you remain nimble? Because there is somebody in their dorm room who could eat you up for lunch the next day. You know, I, my belief on this is, uh, first of all, that's completely correct, and you can't, uh, you can never assure anybody that that can't happen. But I think if you have a customer-centric culture, that cures a lot of ills. Because we wake up, if, let's say you're the leader in a particular arena. Uh, if you're competitor-focused and you're already the leader, then where does your energy come from? Whereas if you're customer-focused and you're already the leader, customers are never satisfied. So you always, if you're customer focused, you're always waking up wondering, how can we make that customer say, wow? How can we, you know, our energy, our passion, we want to impress our customers. We want them to say, wow. And that accountability really matters to you as well. You're Absolutely. very accountable to your customers. We love, we, we love it. You know, it's, it's a, uh, 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 it's that kind of divine discontent uh, it w comes from observing customers and noticing that, you know, things can always be better. Where will Seattle be 10 years from now? We'll have more about its innovative streak when we return to Four Peaks. Four Peaks is made possible by generous support from the Museum of History and Industry and from Weber Shandwick.
Welcome back to Four Peaks and the grand opening of the Bezos Center for Innovation at the Museum of History and Industry. And we have one final question for the executive director of the museum, Leonard Garfield. Leonard, 10 years from now, as you look at the generations of kids coming through here, what do you hope to see from them? My vision in 10 years is that some of those great ideas that germinate here with just a fun exercise actually become real things that move the needle, that begin to manifest themselves, that we can look back at the Innovation Center, its exhibits, its programs, its grand challenges which we'll have, and say that this is a place that sharpened the edge of Seattle as an innovative place and kept it alive for the next generation. What are you doing specifically to guarantee that you're sustaining the relationship and that energy as they leave the exhibit? Every good idea that a young person has at the center becomes part of a digital library that we're collecting. So you can share your great idea, you can work with your colleagues or with strangers to make that idea better right here in the center by using the tools of innovators. And then that, that all gets recorded digitally and becomes part of our archive, which we'll continue to refresh and to review and to explore uh, for great ideas. And when you leave the center, you can participate in one of our grand challenges. So we're gonna have everyone in the community, from the junior high school kid up to the seasoned entrepreneur, help identify what is the big issue that we need to tackle as a community. Work in teams, find innovative answers, and then the center leverage those answers with resources, with connections, to help actually make those become real. So I think it's gonna be a terrific thing. Museums haven't done it before, so we're sort of, we're on day one to use a famous phrase of a really great innovative new idea. Any chance one day it'll be the Museum of History, Industry and Innovation? I think we're almost there. Inspiring the next generation of innovators may begin here, but it ultimately comes down to education, collaboration and access to the right kind of resources to assure the next chapter in Seattle's history. I'm Hanson Hossein. Thanks for watching Four Peaks. Production of Four Peaks would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors.